are we all victims? Not everybody has the pirate, but everybody has a victim. It's not that there's a part of us that where life sends a saboteur to get us. It's that we sabotage ourselves because we're terrified of more responsibility. You don't speak victim anymore. You stop using the word blame and deserve and entitled. So it has nothing to do with the world. It has to do with the headgear that I have on and I'm wearing the, the victim headphones. The time has come to shift how we do things. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to take back your power, then do we have the Power of Archetypes show for you. Today I'll be talking with Carolyn Mace, one of my all-time favorite guests about the power of archetypes and key archetypal types that affect your life. So welcome back to the show, Carolyn. Are you ready to shine? No, oh Michael, I don't know if I can keep up with your enthusiasm, but yes. I wonder sometimes if I can keep up with you. You have an amazing series on your YouTube channel. And I mentioned it off air and and I forewarned you I would mention it on air. It is too cool about the power of archetypes. And it is some of the most fun, fresh, and yet informative isn't the right word. Important things I've seen on YouTube in a long, long time, Carolyn. Thank you. That is so kind of you. Thank you. And true. So on that note, what are archetypes and what do they have to do with taking back our power? The word archetypes is a bit intimidating. And I think another way to think of it is labels. Okay. We label people and we do it archetypally. We do it instinctively. Everybody's sits back and they, you know, they'll, they'll look at someone and think automatically that's a geek. That's this, that, but that person's good at, at, um, I bet that person's an entrepreneur. I bet that person, you just, we do it automatically. We always do psychic readings on each other. And what an archetype is, is a pattern of power. And that pattern of power is in us. We have a number of patterns of power that, serve as governing parameters for our life. So, for example, I have the teacher archetype, obviously, but I don't have the athlete. So even though I can go to a gym and I can try to work out, it doesn't do me any good because I will never be an athlete. There's no way. There's not the best trainer in the world can not turn me into an athlete because I don't have the archetypal pattern and contained within your patterns. We could think of it as an energetic magnetics so that within the archetypal pattern that you have, each one, all of them, 12 of them, let's say, they each connect you then to the laws of the universe, the creative laws of the universe, the laws of cause and effect, the laws of synchronicity, the laws of coincidence, the laws of action and reaction. This, 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 you know, why do addicts find addicts? Because the law of magic, they find each other. They're like magnetic attraction. Archetypal patterns are so, they, they just kind of govern our way around. But they also, in ourselves, what we do with our archetypal patterns is we operate within the parameters of them. So um, we draw from their history. So for example, if a woman has the mother archetype, that mothership called the mother archetype, the moment she gets engaged in the experience of mothering, that ship is like... I've got one of those in the other room. All right. Okay. And immediately, immediately the mother instincts go and they explode. And all of a sudden, everything, everything, everything is about the nurturing of the life she just gave birth to. And, and nobody ever wrote the rules for mothering, but they're archetypal, which is why you can spot someone when we see someone not care for their child a certain way. We recoil because they're breaking rules, rules that were never 
officially written, but they are archetypally known in the code. You do not neglect your child. That comes before your life now. And that's all there's to it. And you come second because you've given birth to something that's helpless. And until that human being is fully functioning, that one comes first. So let's step back. Thank you so much. Let's step back for a second. So what we're really talking about is patterns of power. And I want to talk about these patterns and whether we can actually break the patterns. But with that said, let's talk about the archetype of the victim. Are we all victims? Let's talk about the victim, the child, the prostitute, and the saboteur. I'm going to put them all together. Okay, very good. In a blender might be interesting. Yeah, it is. Because these four contain what I'd call the obstacle course for developing self-esteem. So that in each of our lives, not I don't think all the archetypes are universal. For example, not everybody has the pirate, but everybody has a victim. Everybody has a saboteur. Everybody has a child and everybody has a prostitute. These are aspects of each one of us that we engage as we work our way through survival issues in life. We all have to look at the world and think, Am I, I have to find a way to not be victimized or to victimize. What am I going to do here? And that's a, that's a fundamental question every human being has, it asks themselves. Will I be victimized by this world? What skills do I need to protect myself so that I'm not victimized? Okay. We, so, uh, or do I victimize others? How this is a, a fundamental force in us that comes out of our survival, our need to survive, as does the child in us, the child that has to come be able to feel like I can be in this world and I can see, still see the world innocently, but I have to also grow up. I have to grow up. All right. And then the saboteur is yet another fundamental archetypal pattern, which I find fascinating. So fascinating, Michael, because it's not that there's a part of us that where life sends a saboteur to get us. It's that we sabotage ourselves because we're terrified of more responsibility. We're actually terrified, not of success. Um, but we're terrified of if I do become successful, what if other people need me in ways I don't want to be needed? What if I am then, what if I have to be more responsible for others in a way that I don't want to be? People sabotage their health all the time. I wrote a book on this on, on why people don't heal because they found that being wounded in the language of wounds is a very empowering language. Let me pause you there. Being wounded and the language of wounds is very positive, did you say? Empowering. Empowering. How so? Well, <clears throat> for one thing, we have a culture where if we're, we have a society, that culture, we have a society in which we think that if we're wounded, we have a right to sue. So we can make money off of wounds. And that's a whole lifestyle for a lot of people. That's okay? every billboard down here that I okay. see. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that in fact, we're owed something if we're wounded. I'm owed something. Okay. Another part of wounds is that as long as I'm wounded, I get to somehow pass that pain on and control others. So I have a bad day at work. I come home. I yell at you. You have nothing to do with my bad day, nothing. And then, then you say, what's going on here? And, I, and I'll tell you, I've had this horrible day at work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, and it's likely that you'll say to me, oh, I'm so sorry that you had a bad day. And the next thing you know, I get to dump all over you. And, that, and I get to control the atmosphere because I've been wounded. 
that sounds like it comes to another archetype. And I'm jumping ahead, and I want to go back to the victim, the child, and the saboteur. But that jumps ahead to the archetype of uh, Dracula, the vampire. Well, you know, the vampire, I tell you, that's a fascinating archetype for me for all kinds of reasons. Um, One is how old it is in, in human history, so that there's always been this mythic creature that drains human blood, blood, and that they've chosen the fifth chakra, which is the willpower for the draining. But it's always been a creature of the night, okay? A creature of horror, a demonic kind of creature, Except in our day, in which it's been converted to a romantic figure, a a figure of seduction that that there was that. What are those series, Michael? There's True Blood, and there's um. Uh, You you were talking about it, not not in Oregon, up in uh, Twin Forks. Yeah, what is that called? Uh, What is that? And and you mentioned also Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, Twilight. Twilight. Yes. Yes. Good call. The Twilight series. I could not remember that to save my soul. Um, but think about that, that these are these these creatures of the night were turned into something that people aspire to. But look what's happened simultaneously. We have such a fear of the afterlife, such a fear of our bodies aging that we've taken unconsciously these creatures that in exchange for selling our soul, they'll let our body live forever. And that's actually attractive to people. What's interesting, and you've touched on it as well, we're going into an age of energy. I call it the age of the mystic, living on both sides of the veil. We are no longer just the physical, and we recognize that our energy in many ways trumps physicality. It is the energy of the addict that attracts another addict. So it seems to me that as our as we're going into this age of I'll call it empowerment of energy the I don't know I can call it the system the matrix the something is actually in a sense disempowering us equal to our new empowerment to try to keep us from recognizing who and what we are Oh I totally believe that the dark comes and plays with the light all the time that's totally right. Just, just can think about this. Just as we are emerging in this age of consciousness, so too are we drugged, right? The pharmaceuticals get the other end of it. Just as because, just as we are journeying in, like the inner inner self, inner space and outer space are the two new frontiers. Okay. And and I and I think they mirror each other. I think we are as vast on the inside as we are on the outside, that, the, that the, our inner space is filled with nebula and galaxies and who knows what else to, that remains what? I, I, I don't want to interrupt, but there's a word you're going to love. Intronaut. Intronaut. We have an astronaut for traveling out there. Now we're becoming intronauts. Intr- intronaut. I was going to say, how could there be a word I don't know? And I don't know that word. <laughs> we're traveling inwards. That's where the, the, the journey into the unknown to boldly go where no one has gone before is actually, and you talk about this, the vastness on the inside is at least as great and immense as the vastness on the outside. The Hubble telescope really has nothing, the James Webb telescope, nothing on what we're going to discover as we take the inner journey. Bingo. Bingo. Yes. And that inner journey I absolutely know that, first of all, we're going to need a whole new vocabulary, but that inner journey is the journey, and a way to describe it is the journey from thinking in terms of horizontal time, hour by hour, hour, but to becoming vertical, moving into simultaneity, okay? And I know that when I, when I was, had my career as a medical intuitive, what I did was when I would do readings on people, I would track uh, what I would call where they were hemorrhaging. And and so that's why I drew this drawing of a person with lines coming through and then the the hemorrhage points. And what I eventually realized is that the um, things that we anchor ourselves into, and this will all lead back to archetypes, believe it or not, but 
the the issues we anchor ourselves to, you know, I've got to have this or my cravings that Buddha would say, my cravings, my stuff in the world, uh, this, that, my resentments, all that stuff, they, that becomes energetic anchors. And the more you drain your energy, the more dense you become. You densify, you solidify. And the more you lighten up, you actually do lighten up which is how the proportions of energy and matter shifted for the mystics, which is how they levitated. They literally would have experiences in which they became more light than matter. They literally became more light-filled than matter-based. Okay, Now, I think that we are on this journey of entering into vertical time, simultaneity, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, a hologram consciousness. And I think that that, ex- that explains a lot of the experiences of um, um, autism and the increase in what I would call perceptual disorders where we're perceiving more data in our energetic atmosphere than our brain can comprehend. We haven't opened up the passageways yet for, we haven't adapted to our nuclear mystical energetic reality. We are now in this very vulnerable stage of adaptation to, so all traditional religions are getting dismantled because we can't afford earth centric religions anymore. We need a galactic based theology that is bio-spiritual, ecologically centered, so that we understand God is light, law, and love, and that goes everywhere. So we are, we are actually undergoing, in my opinion, the most phenomenal shift in the history of humanity. We will not, you and I, live to see it complete, but we are, we are on the precipice of where humanity has to go to survive itself, Michael, because we created our own weapons of mass destruction without the moral code to uncreate it and without the means to uncreate it. And so those two fundamental currents in us, the capacity to create and the capacity to survive, are actually in a type of collision because there's nothing we can create that will allow us to survive our own destructive capabilities. So our only way through this to guarantee your daughter will have a life and her daughter will have one is that if we become different creatures. I can't remember an interview where I'm crying. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. We must become incapable of being the people to use the weapons we created we must become a new species i mean and and i think in so many ways i think that's what triggered what we call now we call i mean it was once called the new age but as we released nuclear weapons we had to release the nuclear soul in us our own nuclear power but evil went nuclear too the shadow has the same power as the light. Let's go there with the victim archetype. And it's actually, it's the victim. It's also uh, a vampire, which is, if I go, poor me, woe is me. Listen to my tale of woe. Listen to my tale of woe. Listen to my tale of woe, which is actually like putting a finger on the button. Because if I blow you up, I get power in theory. But we're all on the same planet. However, what's the dynamic going on there? Because this is the darkness and the light. We are a species that heavily victimized all life for a long time. And when we opened up the passages to inner space, starting in the 60s, we then made great efforts to nurture and do therapy and to take on the fact that being victimized is a profound suffering. And, and I mean, whether you look at the size of the Holocaust and, and, and Pol Pot fields and all the way, and the, the Native American people, slavery, my God, this planet is full of victims. 
But what we and what we have to understand from this is that victimizing a human being is one of the great sins that that we do against each other. Now, what causes us to do this is what we need to look at, Michael. And here is where I, I would offer this to think about, and that's that I do believe that all of us are, are on the same journey in life, and this is how I would describe it. I would say all of us start out having to deal with our love of power and all that that meant, because the first way we look, you have a beautiful daughter. She's now about to enter into the stage of, oh, does this go in my mouth? Does this go in my mouth? Is this mine? Is this mine? What is this? What is that? So it's the world of touch and her senses. Do I smell this? Do I eat this? What do I do with this? It's the world of stuff. And so that's where we all start. And so that's our first encounter with power is stuff, the world of stuffology. And eventually <clears throat> we have to go into the world of inner power. And so we do this struggle between our love. We think of the, let me say it this way. The journey is to become empowered enough so that we make the transition from our love of power to the power of love. But what is, but what is the great fear people have? It's, it's not people will, are generous enough to give blankets, but they won't give power. And it's power that transforms a human being, not a blanket. It's power. It's the capacity to empower someone. It's the capacity to love them enough to give them their dignity and to not victimize them, to not keep them victimized. What we're looking at in our world is that all the politics, everything is completely organized to keep certain groups of people disempowered, lest they take the stuff of the other people. This fear of other human beings and the fear of what they will do and the fear of what we will do to each other this is what's destroying us. The fear that if I empower you, then I know what you're going to do. You'll take over the legislature and pretty soon we'll have laws that equalize things for black and pe brown and people of color. And, oh, no, what will our poor white race do? I mean, th this trauma, color trauma that that has existed for centuries. I mean, th the size of what this planet has to deal with. <laughs> It, it, it's interesting because I, I, we have moved down for the spring to St. Augustine, Florida. And St. Augustine has an interesting history. It's the oldest incorporated uh, white village, you could say. They call it the oldest incorporated city. But there were other places here <laughs> before uh, the Spanish arrived. But it has a history of... One people came, killed the other people. Another people came, killed that people. Another people came and killed that people. And I've been thinking about this, and, it, and, it's, and it's, it's really boggling the mind that somebody from Spain or somebody from England would say, for love of God and country, which means either to gain power or to gain a sense of self, again, a sense of esteem, a sense of self-worth, would travel thousands of miles across the ocean over 50% of their fleet was known, would get wiped out each time to come and kill and burn down a tiny little village before going back and half of those people are going to die on the way back as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. Extraordinary, isn't it? It is, and it makes me wonder, what's the driver in humanity? How much have we come here wounded and not realizing that we are worthy and that we are love, because each of these archetypes, they're all based from what I understand on being able to come back to a sense of worth and self-esteem. And it's not just worth and self-esteem, but you're right. It's getting to that place. But more than that, it's getting to a place where, I, as I tell my students, one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself is to not take your life personally, is to, is to not take your life personally 
the events of your life personally and to look at the at each other through symbolic lens so that when you feel victimized, for example, instead of saying that person's victimizing me, say here I am again in my victim archetype. How is it I see the world that I attract this? What it, when you put on an archetypal lens, you no longer see the world as coming toward you, but coming through you. It makes me think of Don Miguel Ruiz, and he has a brilliant book from a couple of years ago, The Actor. What you're talking about is the archetype is, I'm going to recognize now I am putting on the costume of the victim. I am playing the role of the victim, but I am not the victim. In fact, the victim role is here to teach me and for me to learn from it until I am willing to take off that costume and let it go. And not only that, you're actually right. That's perfect. It also says that it also makes the person you think is victimizing you very impersonal. Like it wouldn't have mattered if it was that person, Tom, Dick, Harry, Mary, Jerry, anybody I will see anybody as victimizing me when I'm in this costume. So you become as impersonal about what happened to you as you do about the, the pattern itself. You realize it would, would it have mattered who, who took it from me as long when I'm in a victim mode, anybody can victimize me because I hear the whole world in victim language. I'm incapable of discerning. So it has nothing to do with the world. It has to do with the headgear that I have on, and I'm wearing the the victim headphones. These are some pretty big victim headphones, but what I can actually do, and, and maybe that's part of the journey, is I can recognize that, and because I can play with energy, because this is the age, as you call it, the age of energy, the term I used to I like to use is Tai Chi, I can take that energy and that's the, all it is, is energy, the energy of the victim. I can transform that into a little or a little bit of love. That's a new word. We're going to play with new words today, a little bit of love. And I can actually send that, transmit that to the person in quotes that is my victimizer, knowing they are me and they're playing a role as well. Precisely. Precisely. And not only that, that that love is delivered like a light message. Just think, you, you have, it's a light telegram. It's, it's literally, it's a telegram of light that says, here's my message to you. You must be going through the same stuff I'm going through. But I'm not playing this anymore, so you're on your own. But I bless you, and I thank you for this so much for this journey. Send him a light telegram. Woohoo! So let's go back to the victim, the child, the saboteur, and let's see where we can get. What more should we talk about, or would you like to tell us about the victim? Because we, this is so universal. All of us have played this role at a minimum and or had this role played on us, or through us and for us, shall I say. Uh, because it's universal, everybody can uh, anticipate being victimized and that they victimize. So you have to look at yourself from both directions. It's been my experience when I teach archetypes that people look at archetypes and they look at these ones that are, are st that strongly are connected to wounded behavior and they only look at what was done to them, but they never look at how they victimize others. And when they do, they're full of excuses like, well, this was done to me or I had a bad childhood and here comes the child archetype always providing the excuses for childlike behavior. But this is where it also such, such um, uh, an approach allows a person the choice, and it's a difficult one, to detach from their own experiences and realize I'm living a very similar, uh, all of our victim experiences are versions of the same archetype, though, admittedly, some people have had hellacious childhoods and really horrible experiences of being victim. I, we're not losing our home. We're not in Ukraine. We're not getting bombed. We're not getting victimized in a war. We're not. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's experiences 
that are really off the charts here. But the size of an experience does not diminish the truth at all, no matter how horrific. And this is where you have to stretch your mystical wings out. And that's that the universe doesn't view each of the experiences with the same, how do I say, gravitas that we give each experience. We see each experience from the bottom up like the biggest building in town. But from the point of view of the universe, everything is passing and it's all happening and it's just energy and it's a it's a viewpoint we can't comprehend. We can't only discuss it. We can't it, 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 we can't access it. But if someone's had a near death experience or they've they've ever been able to get out of Kronos time and into Kairos and then have to fit themselves back into Kronos time. They know that even the slightest vantage point that is light filled eclipses everything that's happening in the moment. Can you repeat that for me? Cause that is par- perhaps the most profound thing that's been said so far today. And there's been some goodies. Well, what I'm saying is that, the capacity to get out of the Kronos world, the time-based world, and into the Kairos space, a, a, a position of getting into the balcony of light, even for a microsecond. As Teresa of Avila would say, if God gets in the walls of your soul, even for a second, it's enough for a lifetime. And honestly, that is the truth. And you you get back into your body and what you've experienced is what timelessness feels like, what eternity feels like. And it, it positions everything here as it should be passing rapidly, passing rapidly. And, and, and the great pain of the mystics that I, I'm understanding more and more as I get older is that when they would say like Francis of Assisi or to of Avila or of any of the great mystics, the psalm writers, their great pain did not come because their bodies were were shriveling with disease. It was because they saw the choices human beings could be making, but they didn't for fear of loss of this physical world, not knowing how much, for example, Michael, if human beings were not afraid to empower each other, If in fact we thought that way, like what can we do to get the world out of this famine, out of climate change? What can we do to stop the war? What can we do? What can we do? If we worked at that level and prayed at that level, we would be given inspiration at that level. But we don't. It's my, I see spirituality, whatever we want to call it, is always the flip side of the same coin. The answer, the answer is always found on the same, uh, you could say the antidote and the poison are on the same coin. And so where the world appears on one level to be going darker and less empowering, I view it as a, the one thing I know about humanity is finally when her, his back is up against the wall, we do something. And if we're disempowered enough, I'm hopeful that actually brings us to the light. It's sort of like the addict who says, when I hit a tree or lose my wife, I will finally change. And they do. And so I'm hopeful, as crazy as it sounds. And you and I and countless millions, maybe more than that across the planet, are doing this work now of helping empower others. And it's not just you and I, it's actually the person sitting in the living room who's doing a little meditation for themselves and they're shifting their energy that is helping empower others. That's where it's all at. I'm hopeful that we're getting to that place because we're being disempowered, that we're gonna actually shift into the light. You know, it's darkest before the dawn. Isn't that the truth? And I think this is, you know, another feature about this age that we are living in is so extraordinary is this is the age in which we are meant to discover that we are co-creators, that we are not victims of what's happening out there, 
but we are in fact active participant participants in the events that happen and unfold on this earth. And that um, as such, we, we have to learn that every word we say is actually an act of creation. Every thought we have is an act of creation. And, and we go through stages of learning this. This is what has turned us into an, a society of narcissists that think every single word we say is so significant, but it's a stage of our own evolution because we have to realize, um, how could you say that word to me? How powerful a word is. It, it's made us hypersensitive so we can become hyper aware that in fact, wow, one word is that. I better not use that word. And if I do use that word, it's an act of creation. It's, you know, it's, it's this kind of thing. And how important is it to watch the words we say to ourselves? So I think we are the most, um, if you want to talk about being the victimizer, being the saboteur, being the vampire, all these things, <laughs> we, I don't know if it's been trained or entrained into us, we turn on ourselves. Totally. Of course. Of course. And I think, I think that um, what I tell my students is when you, when you wake up in the morning, never, do not start your day off by telling yourself something negative like, oh, God, look at this weather. What difference does that make? Just look outside and say, look at this gorgeous rain. Look at this beautiful sunshine. Look at everything is beautiful. If you are alive, it's beautiful. And even if you're on the other side, right? But I mean, you, you look at, I mean, you can't let all these outside factors have a vote on how you are going to be on the inside. This is an exercise in organizing your power. And each archetype is about becoming that, what we say, fully embodied co-creator that we came here to be. Yes. Yes, totally. What can you tell us? And, and, and I like that. As, as, as someone who's, who's almost bit the dust more, than a, uh, more times than I care to uh, share, uh, seeing my toes wiggle in the morning, that's a woohoo moment. <laughs> yeah, and, and it the truth. Tell us about the, the archetype of the saboteur. Well, you know, the, we, are, we are really terrified of our own empowerment. And because what we're terrified of is that the more empowered we become, people associate that with meaning power to tell you what to do. And that nobody tells me. It's not that at all. The empowerment is about becoming conscious. And the more conscious you become, the more you cannot negotiate your conscience. You become very clear about what is right, what is wrong. What is a sin? What is not a sin? How your actions impact others? What do you become conscious of? So we sabotage our capacity to, to see the truth clearly. We sabotage our capacity to run out of excuses to love somebody. We don't want to open our heart that fast. We don't. That's what we sabotage. We don't like, uh, uh, we sabotage becoming more empowered because if we are, we have to be more courageous. We have to be more honest. And those are the things people are terrified of. They're not afraid of failure. They're afraid of integrity. They're afraid of honesty. They're afraid of courage and being, and real, really sensing the guidance to act courageously. They're afraid of standing up for their brothers and sisters. This is why people sabotage themselves. They don't want to become someone who God calls by name, but they want to be near someone who God calls by name. It's interesting because it is a time period, again, looking at the darkness before the dawn, where <laughs> you take my power, you take my power, as we're becoming... Look at our politicians. Look at our politicians. We're surrounded in seas of liars, absolute liars who no longer have the courage to say one truthful thing. Not one. Somewhere along the line, people should have been in the streets screaming, stop lying to me. 
But in fact, they just blew it off like lying. Well, everyone lies. No big deal. I, 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 I love everyone. It's the best way I can put it. There is a story of a politician that uh, admits lies, uh, lied on everything and got into office. And the way the rules work, that's fine. That's okay. I got to say that's weird, Carolyn. <laughs> that's really, really weird. Not just that they're in and they're accepted in the in club, but that that's okay. Okay, so why would a collective society be sabotaging itself so much? Why? Why would we be doing that? Why are we doing that? Why are we refusing to get to a place? Why are the politicians only attacking each other and not working together to make this country a better place? Because they cannot bear the truth that the time has come to shift how we do things and that we, we, we have to become a more empowered country by including everybody, and they can't bear to do that. It's so true. So we're going to lose the country because they will not take that. Just like the Catholics will lose the church because those anal, dinosauric creatures called cardinals will not advance to the 21st century and ordain women. So rather than get over their genital, genital phobias, they'll lose the church. What do we do as individuals then to say, I'm not going to give away my power anymore. It's scary. I feel like I've never been given this amount of responsibility before. And we have, well, I can speak personally, growing up with what I call the screw-up team. What if I mess things up? How do we step back into our power? Well, I think you're not, you're not stepping back into it. You never had it if you have to, right? So come and talk that way. How do I accept and work with my power? The first is you don't speak victim anymore. You stop using the word blame and deserve and entitled. And you assume the mantra, humble up. I got to humble up here. You have to start making rules for your life that says, I have to include other people in my decisions. That I, I have to exist within the laws of nature and not out, I am not an outlaw to live outside the laws. The idea that I would never, for example, tell my child, you're special. You're so special. You're, because your child will never be special to me. She'll be special to you as she should be. But to grow up thinking that the rest of the world will think that she's special takes the edge off her survival capacity. You're destroying that mechanism in her. In fact, what you should tell her is this is a great big huge world now i think you are the be all and end all but as soon as you walk out that door that stops so we have to get you ready to walk out that door you're not entitled to anything so i want you to understand that everything good that happens to you is happening because some other source is looking after you so I look after you here, but when you walk out that door, I'm entrusting you to your angel and to your instincts and to your senses. So you and I will pray before you leave this house. But I need you to be able to rely on your internet, inner net. Thank you. I'm going to go to three more archetypes real briefly. The shapeshifter. The shapeshifter. How fascinating is that archetype, huh? To change the shape of something. Well, I, you know, one of the examples I use is advertisers are great shapeshifters. They can take any product in the world and make you think that it'll even change your shape. Eat this and you'll shrink. You know, <laughs> eat this and you won't age. Eat this and you'll be healthy forever. That's a classic shapeshifter in an, in an advertising company. It'll change your shape. Um, but the shapeshifter is that, uh, what is that? What is the word? They do gaslighting. They'll change the shape of something that, you know, like Fox news, like 
what's his Tucker Carlson January 6th was just a picnic you know just a bunch of tourists when in fact it was the worst insurrection since the war of 1812 he's a shapeshifter he takes the news and repackages it bankers repackage things so that look what happens they change the shape of what should be common sense so it brings us back to storytellers are great shapeshifters, and that's the positive side. They could take something that is absolutely diabolical in your brain and say, let me, like like we do with the kids at night when they were little, like, let me re- ch- change the shape. Darkness is not dark, it's cozy. I'm going to change the shape of this. So there's so many, there's so many gifts in the shapeshifter. But when you're in the shadow side of it, look out. And then let's go to the starving artist. Oh, wow. Oh, how many people can relate to that? Don't you just see Paris and with, with Toulouse Lautrec and, and and all that great artists there? That I am sure comes from going all the way back to Aristotle and Plato, to the separation of reason and logic and beauty and virtue that formed Western society from the get go from these two mega souls, Plato and Aristotle, who took the helm and said, no, 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 it's reason and logic. No, 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 no. And then Aris, then then Aquinas got his hands on them. And this value system that said it's logic and iron and steel over the artistic. And so we always had this idea that if you aren't from this came the God of productivity, You have to produce, produce, produce. And that's what God wants you to do is be productive, productive, productive. And you'll know that God's on your side if you have change in your wallet. So we became very much, we did a whole financial theology around the Aristotelian thinking that there's a God of productivity and it's the God of earth and God of reason and God of logic. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. So when the artist comes by, And someone says, my father said to me, I don't care what you're going to do when you get out of college as long as you're a teacher or a nurse. Because for him, those were the two Aristotelian occupations that guaranteed an income. He said, what's a writer? How are you going to earn a living? Who possibly pays anyone to write a sentence? Okay. All right. But the creative world we do not value because it is that platonic world of thoughts and that we're pulling in and et cetera. But it is that world that keeps this world from killing us. And the starving artist is someone as that archetype that embodies the struggle between these two forces, the force of the practical and the force of the visionary, the force of the, the, the dreamer, the imagination, the what, the creative world versus the physical. What has yet to be born with what's already here. And the artist is committed to what has yet to be born. And so how many of them stand on that bridge between what's already here, maybe I should just keep putting more screws in this in a different way, or maybe I should go inside and follow my vision. And as I've said to my students, get a second job if you have to, but follow that more than anything. Now you're speaking, well, the whole time you've been speaking my language. There's this this story, this parable, I'm not going to get it right. It's about like a hundred ants and a rainstorm, and they've got to go under the ground. The ants go marching one by one into the ground, and they have a choice. Do we bring another worker ant, or do we bring an artist with us? Oh, I've never heard this. And in the old paradigm, we bring another working ant for our survival. In the new paradigm, you bring the artist with everything you've got because that's where the energy is at. And that's the energy shift that's going to come from the artist that cannot come from the person who's just playing with steel that will change everything. Precisely. It won't come from the practical it will come from the imaginary. Imagine what hasn't been done. What is your YouTube channel? It's my name. 
Perfect. Can you spell that for people? Yes, Caroline Mace, M-Y-S-S. And there's a number of lectures and free workshops and all kinds of things. And then my archetype uh, videos, which are free. They're just up. I just do this once a week for fun. But I chose the prostitute, of course, because I think that every single human being has to discover that their soul is currency, their energy is currency, their creativity is currency. And what will you sell to survive? Will you sell your integrity? Will you sell your creativity? Will you sell your silence? Will you sell your body? The physical prostitute's the most honest. It's, we all face acts of, we all face the prostitute, like what will we compromise in ourselves? in order to maintain physical stability, which leads to profound act of betrayal in ourselves. And bringing it full circle today, what you said is we're most afraid in stepping into our power of, I'll use my word here, being in alignment or coherence with our true self, of, of being that word is such a slippery slope, but playing at a higher, on a higher moral ground with ourselves. And really being able to, to see, acknowledge, and act on truth. We run out of excuses. Consciousness means we've run out of excuses. We retire excuses. We realize entitlement comes from weakness. It comes from arrogance. And, and, when you realize, wait a minute, I'm in this all together. And you weigh, you weigh your actions and your choices so differently. The more conscious you become, which is why people sabotage that. I'll close with this. Someone in a workshop, I was talking about the power of forgiveness. And um, this man stood up and said, stop it. I don't want to hear anymore. I don't want to hear anymore. He said, if I, 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 I know what you're saying is the truth. The truth, he said, not true, but the truth. And that's a big deal. He said, but I can't afford to know it's the truth because I live with people who will, who will misinterpret that I'm, I'm, they'll think I'm just saying that everything they're doing is okay and that that's why I'm forgiving them. He said, when in fact, he said, I'm forgiving them for these higher reasons because it's all about my not wanting to bring out the worst in myself. And he said, they'll just keep doing what they're doing. I still need my anger in order to survive where I'm at. And this higher truth about the power of forgiveness is destroying me. And he left my workshop. And I have often wondered if he could stay with the people he was with, because I know that once a higher truth takes hold of you. You can't let it go. The, the ship has sailed. And, and, and you have to find a way to live the truth that has penetrated into your heart. You have to. It just. And my guess is if they're drawn to watching any of your work, if they're drawn to watching any of my work, then they've been touched. Because that's the hope. To me, it's the light is... is infecting all of us. We have all been infected. It's then what the heck do we do with it? Penetrating. Penetrating. Not infected. It's penetrating us, but it's true. It's penetrating all of us. Yes. Yes. And it's a beautiful thing. And I'm going to use a line that I don't think I've used on, on air before. But since I've had my two NDEs, I, I, I will proudly use it. Integration is a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, 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 that is the truth. But there's no other choice than forward. This has been phenomenal, Carolyn. This has been, this is, I, this is my new all-time favorite. This is my new, I, big hugs, lots of love. I haven't even wrapped up, but just love, 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 love. Thank you, honey. 
this is so important. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, check out everything Carolyn Mace has to offer and particularly the power of archetypes and begin empowering yourself, not re-empowering yourself, empowering yourself today and shine bright. Woohoo! What a special, beautiful, amazing, tearful, joyous, honest, raw, important interview this was and um man i don't even know where to go with this there will be another amazing interview coming up video coming up that you'll be able to check out go to dailywoohoo.com if you want a daily attunement energetic vibration uh, newsletter that will raise your vibration on a day-to-day basis that's at dailywoohoo.com of course, we've got our School of Mystics. We've got our automatic writing book. And there's even a link below for our backstage pass. Here's a link to the next amazing video. DailyWooHoo.com is your one stop to raise your vibration. Love you guys so, so much. Keep on shining bright. Woohoo! How does it get any better than this? Wow, Carolyn. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs>